Chapter 51 Nazareth is wonderfully interesting because the town has an air about it of being precisely as Jesus left it. And one finds himself saying all the time, The boy Jesus has stood in this doorway, has played in that street, has touched these stones with his hands, has rambled over these chalky hills. Whoever shall write the boyhood of Jesus ingeniously will make a book which will possess a vivid interest for young and old alike. I judge so from the greater interest we found in Nazareth than any of our speculations upon Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee gave rise to. It was not possible, standing by the Sea of Galilee, to frame more than a vague, faraway idea of the majestic personage who walked upon the crested waves as if they were solid earth, and who touched the dead and they rose up and spoke. I read among my notes now, with a new interest, some sentences from an edition of the 1621 of the Apocryphal New Testament. There's an extract. Christ kissed by a bride made dumb by sorcerers, cures her. A leprous girl, cured by the water in which the infant Christ was washed and becomes the servant of Joseph and Mary, the leprous son of a prince cured in like manner. A young man who had been bewitched and turned into a mule, miraculously cured by the infant Savior, being put on his back and is married to the girl who had been cured of leprosy, whereupon the bystanders praise God. Chapter 16. Christ miraculously widens or contracts gates, milk pails, sieves, or boxes, not properly made by Joseph, he not being skillful at his carpenter's trade. The king of Jerusalem gives Joseph an order for a throne, Joseph works on it for two years and makes it two spans too short. The king being angry with him, Jesus comforts him, commands him to pull one side of the throne while he pulls the other and brings it to its proper dimensions. From chapter 19, Jesus, charged with throwing a boy from the roof of a house, miraculously causes the dead boy to speak and acquit himself fetches water for his mother, breaks the pitcher, and miraculously gathers the water in his mantle and brings it home. Sent to a schoolmaster, refuses to tell his letters, and the schoolmaster going to whip him, his hand withers. Further on in this quaint volume of rejected Gospels is an epistle of St. Clement to the Corinthians which was used in the churches and considered genuine fourteen or fifteen hundred years ago. In it, this account of the fabled phoenix occurs. 1. Let us consider the wonderful type of the resurrection which is seen in eastern countries today, that is to say, in Arabia. 2. There is a certain bird called a phoenix, of this there is never but one at a time, and that lives five hundred years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near, that it must die, it makes itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices, into which, when its time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. 3. But its flesh putrefying breeds a certain worm, which being nourished by the juice of the dead bird, brings forth feathers, and when it has grown to a perfect state, it takes up the nest in which the bones of its parent lie, and carries it from Arabia into Egypt, to a city called Heliopolis. 4. And flying in open day in the sight of all men, lays it upon the altar of the sun, and so returns from hence it came. 5. The priests then search into the records of the time and find that it returned precisely at the end of 500 years. 
Well, business is business, and there's nothing like punctuality, especially in a phoenix. The few chapters relating to the infancy of the Savior contain many things which seem frivolous and not worth preserving. A large part of the remaining portions of the book read like good scripture. However, there is one verse that ought not to have been rejected because it so evidently prophetically refers to the general run of Congresses of the United States. 199. They carry themselves high and as prudent men, and though they are fools, yet would seem to be teachers. Now, I have set these extracts down as I found them. Everywhere among the cathedrals of France and Italy one finds traditions of personages that do not figure in the Bible and of miracles that are not mentioned in its pages. But they are all in this apocryphal New Testament. And though they have been ruled out of our modern Bible, it is claimed that they were accepted gospel 12 or 15 centuries ago and ranked as high in credit as any. One needs to read this book before he visits those venerable cathedrals with their treasures of tabooed and forgotten tradition. They imposed another pirate upon us at Nazareth, another invincible Arab guard. We took our last look at the city, clinging like a whitewashed wasp's nest to the hillside, and at eight o'clock in the morning departed. We dismounted and drove the horses down a bridle path, which I think was fully as crooked as a corkscrew, which I know to be as steep as the downward sweep of a rainbow, and which I believe to be the worst piece of road in the geography, except one in the Sandwich Islands, which I remember painfully, and possibly one or two mountain trails in the Sierra Nevadas. Often, in this narrow path, the horse had to poise itself nicely on a rude stone step and then drop his forefeet over the edge and down something more than half his own height. This brought his nose near the ground while his tail pointed up towards the sky somewhere and gave him the appearance of preparing to stand on his head. A horse cannot look dignified in that position. We accomplished the long descent at last and trotted across the great plain of Estrelon. Some of us will be shot before we finish this pilgrimage. The pilgrims read nomadic life and keep themselves in a constant state of quixotic heroism. They have their hands on their pistols all the time, and every now and then, when you least expect it, they snatch them out and take aim at Bedouins who are not visible, and draw their knives and make savage passes at other Bedouins who do not exist. I'm in deadly peril always, for these spasms are sudden and irregular, and of course I cannot tell when to be getting out of the way. If I am accidentally murdered sometime during one of these romantic frenzies of the pilgrims, Mr. Grimes must be rigidly held to answer as an accessory before the fact. If the pilgrims would take deliberate aim and shoot at a man, it would all be all right and proper, because that man would not be in any danger. But these random assaults are what I object to. I do not wish to see any more places like Esdraelgun, where the ground is level and people can gallop. It puts melodramatic nonsense into the pilgrims' heads. All at once, one is jogging along stupidly in the sun and thinking about something ever so far away. Here they come at a stormy gallop, spurring and whooping at those ridgy old sore-backed plugs till their heels fly higher than their heads, and as they whiz by, out comes a little potato gun of a revolver, and there is a startling little pop, and a small pellet goes singing through the air. 
Now that I've begun this pilgrimage, I intend to go through with it, though sooth to say, nothing but the most desperate valor has kept me to my purpose up to the present time. I do not mind Bedouins. I'm not afraid of them, because neither Bedouins nor ordinary Arabs have shown any disposition to harm us. But I do feel afraid of my own comrades. Arriving at the furthest verge of the plain, we rode a little way up a hill and found ourselves at Endor, famous for its witch. Her descendants are there yet. They were the wildest horde of half-naked savages we have found thus far. They swarmed out of mud beehives, out of hovels of dry goods box pattern, out of gaping caves under shelving rocks, and out of crevasses in the earth. In five minutes, the dead solitude and silence of the place were no more, and a begging, screeching, shouting mob were struggling about the horse's feet and blocking the way. Bakshish! 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 Hawaji! Bakshish! It was Magdala over again. Only here, the glare from the infidel eyes were fierce and full of hate. The population numbers 250, and more than half the citizens live in caves in the rock. Dirt, degradation, and savagery are Endor's specialty. We say no more about Magdala and Deborah now. Endor heads the list. It is worse than any Indian Kampudi. The hill is barren and rocky and forbidding. No sprig of grass is visible. And only one tree, this is a fig tree, which maintains a precarious footing among the rocks at the mouth of the dismal cavern once occupied by the veritable Witch of Endor. In this cave, tradition says, Saul, the king, sat at midnight and stared and trembled while the earth shook. The thunders crashed among the hills, and out of the midst of fire, smoke, the spirit of the dead prophet, rose up and confronted him. Sal had crept to this place in the darkness while his army slept to learn what fate awaited him in the morrow's battle. He went away a sad man to meet disgrace and death. A spring trickles out of the rock in the gloomy recesses of the cavern, and we were thirsty. The citizens of Endor objected to our going in there. They do not mind dirt, they do not mind rags, they do not mind vermin, they do not mind barbarous ignorance and savagery, they do not mind a reasonable degree of starvation, but they do like to be pure and holy before their God, whoever he may be, and therefore they shudder and grow pale at the idea of Christian lips polluting a spring whose waters must descend into their sanctified gullets. We had no wanton desire to wound even their feelings or trample upon their prejudices, but we were out of water, thus early in the day, and we were burning up with thirst. It was at this time and under these circumstances that I framed an aphorism which has already become celebrated. I said, Necessity knows no law. We went in and drank. We got away from the noisy wretches finally, dropping them in squads and couples as we filed over the hills. The aged first, the infants next. The young girls further on, the strong men ran beside us a mile, and only left when they had secured the last possible piastre in the way of bakshish. In an hour we reached Nain, where Christ raised the widow's son to life. Nain is Magdala on a small scale. It has no population of any consequence. Within a hundred yards of it is the original graveyard. For aught I know, the tombstones lie flat on the ground, which is Jewish fashion in Syria. 
I believe the Muslims do not allow them to have upright tombs. A Muslim grave is usually roughly plastered over and whitewashed and has at one end an upright projection which is shaped into exceedingly rude attempts at ornamentation. In the cities there is often no appearance of a grave at all. A tall, slender marble tombstone, elaborately lettered, gilded, and painted, marks the burial place. And this is surmounted by a turban, so carved and shaped as to signify the dead man's rank in life. They showed a fragment of ancient wall, which they said was one side of the gate out of which the widow's dead son was being brought so many centuries ago when Jesus met the procession. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. They glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. Well, a little mosque stands upon the spot, which tradition says was occupied by the widow's dwelling. Two or three aged Arabs sat about its door. We entered, and the pilgrims broke specimens from the foundation walls. Though they had to touch and even step upon the praying carpets to do it. It was almost the same as breaking pieces from the hearts of those old Arabs. To step rudely upon the sacred praying mats with booted feet, a thing not done by any Arab, it was to inflict pain upon men who had not offended us in any way. Suppose a party of armed foreigners were to enter a village church in America and break ornaments from the altar railings for curiosities, and climb up and walk upon the Bible and the pulpit cushions. However, the cases are different. One is the profanation of a temple of our faith, and the other is a, only the profanation of a pagan one. We descended to the plain again and halted a moment at a well of Abraham's time, no doubt. It was in a desert place. It was walled three feet above the ground with squared and heavy blocks of stone after the manner of Bible pictures. Around it some camels stood and others knelt. There was a group of sober little donkeys with naked, dusky children clambering about them, or sitting astride their rumps, or pulling their tails, tawny, black-eyed, barefooted maids arrayed in rags and adorned with brazen armlets and pinchbeck earrings, or poising water jars upon their heads, or drawing water from the well. A flock of sheep stood by, waiting for the shepherds to fill the hollowed stones with water so that they might drink stones which, like those that walled the well, were worn smooth and deeply creased by the chafing chins of a hundred generations of thirsty animals. Picturesque Arabs sat upon the ground in groups and solemnly smoked their long-stemmed chibuks. Other Arabs were filling black hogskins with water, skins which, well filled and distended with water till the short legs projected painfully out of the proper line, looked like the corpses of hogs bloated by drowning. It was a grand oriental picture which I have worshipped a thousand times in soft, rich steel engravings. But in the engravings there was no desolation, 
no dirt, no rags, no fleas, no ugly features, no sore eyes, no feasting flies, no besotted ignorance in the countenances, no raw places on the donkeys' backs, no disagreeable jabbering in unknown tongues, no stench of camels, no suggestion that a couple of tons of powder placed under the party and touched off would heighten the effect and give the scene a genuine interest and a charm which it would always be pleasant to recall. Even though a man lived a thousand years, oriental scenes look best in steel engravings. I cannot be imposed upon any more by that picture of the Queen of Sheba visiting Solomon. I shall say to myself, You look fine, madam, but your feet are not clean and you smell like a camel. Presently, a wild Arab in charge of a camel train recognized an old friend in Ferguson, and they ran and fell upon each other's necks and kissed each other's grimy bearded faces upon both cheeks. It explained instantly as something which had always seemed to me only a far-fetched oriental figure of speech. I refer to the circumstance of Christ rebuking a Pharisee or some other character and reminding him that from him he had received no kiss of welcome. It did not seem reasonable to me that men should kiss each other, but I am aware now that they did. There was reason in it, too. The custom was natural and proper, because people must kiss, and a man would not be likely to kiss one of the women of this country of his own free will and accord. One must travel to learn. Every day now an old scriptural phrase that never possessed any significance for me before take to themselves a meaning. We journeyed around the base of the mountain, Little Hermon, past the old crusader's castle of El Fule, and arrived at Shinum. This was another Magdala, to a fraction. Frescoes and all, here tradition says the prophet Samuel was born. And here the Shunammite woman built a little house upon the city wall for the accommodation of the prophet Elijah. Elijah asked her what she expected in return. It was a perfectly natural question, for these people are and were in the habit of pro-offering favors and services, and then expecting and begging for pay. Elisha knew them well. He could not comprehend that anybody should build for him that humble little chamber for the mere sake of old friendship, and with no selfish motive whatever. It used to seem a very impolite, not to say a rude question, for Elijah to ask the woman, but it does not seem so to me now. The woman said she expected nothing. Then for her goodness and her unselfishness, he rejoiced her heart with the news that she should bear a son. It was a high reward, but she would not have thanked him for a daughter. Daughters have always been unpopular here. The son was born grew, waxed strong, died. Elijah restored him to life and shewn him. We found here a grove of lemon trees, cool, shady, hung with fruit. One is apt to overestimate beauty when it is rare, but to me this grove seemed very beautiful. It was beautiful. I do not overestimate it. It must always remember Shunem gratefully as a place which gave to us this leafy shelter after our long, hot ride. We lunched, rested, chatted, smoked our pipes an hour, and then mounted and moved on. As we trotted across the plain of Jezreel, we met half a dozen digger Indians, Bedouins. 
and with very long spears in their hands, cavorted around an old crowbait horses and spearing imaginary enemies, whooping and fluttering their rags in the wind and carrying on in every respect like a pack of hopeless lunatics. At last, here were the wild, free sons of the desert, speeding over the plain like the wind, on their beautiful Arabian mares we had read so much about and longed so much to see. Here were the picturesque costumes. This was the gallant spectacle. Tatterdemalion vagrants, cheap braggadocio, Arabian mares, spined and necked like the ichthyosaurus in the museum, and humped and cornered like a dromedary. To glance at the genuine son of the desert is to take the romance out of him forever. To behold his steed is to long in charity to strip off his harness and let him fall to pieces. Presently we came to a ruinous old town on a hill, the same being the ancient Jezreel. Ahab, king of Samaria, this was a very vast kingdom for those days, and was very, very nearly half as large as Rhode Island, dwelt in the city of Jezreel, which was his capital. Near him lived a man by the name of Naboth, who had a vineyard. The king asked him for it, and when he would not give it, offered to buy it, but Naboth refused to sell it. In those days it was considered a sort of crime to part with one's inheritance at any price, and even if a man did part with it, it reverted to himself or his heirs again at the next jubilee year. So the spoiled child of a king went and lay down on the bed with his face to the wall and grieved sorely. The queen, a notorious character in those days, and whose name is a byword and a reproach, even in these, came in and asked him wherefore he sorrowed, and he told her. Jezebel said she would secure the vineyard, and she went forth and forged letters to the nobles, wise men, in the king's name and ordered them to proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high before the people, and suborned two witnesses to swear that he had blasphemed. They did it, and the people stoned the accused by the city wall, and he died. Then Jezebel came and told the king, and said, Behold, Naboth is no more. Rise up and seize the vineyard. So Ahab seized the vineyard, and went into it to possess it, but the prophet Elijah came to him there and read him his fate and the fate of Jezebel and said that in the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs should also lick his blood. And he said, likewise, the dog should eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. In the course of time, the king was killed in battle, and when his chariot wheels were Washed in his own pool of Samaria, the dogs licked the blood. In after years, Jehu, who was king of Israel, marched down against Jezreel by order of one of the prophets and administered one of those convincing rebukes so common among the people of those days. He killed many kings and their subjects. And as he came along, he saw Jezebel painted and finely dressed looking out of a window in order that she be thrown down to him. A servant did it, and Jehu's horse trampled her underfoot. Then Jehu went in and sat down to dinner, and presently he said, Go and bury this cursed woman, for she is a king's daughter. The spirit of charity came upon him too late, however, for the prophecy had already been fulfilled. The dogs had eaten her, and they found no more of her than the skull and feet and the palms of her hands. Ahab, the late king, had left a helpless family behind him, and Jehu killed seventy of the orphan sons. 
Then he killed all the relatives and the teachers and servants and friends of the family and rested from his labors until he came near to Samaria, where he met forty-two persons and asked them who they were. They said they were brothers of the king of Judah. He killed them. When he got to Samaria, he said he would show his zeal for the Lord. So he gathered all the priests and people together that worshipped Baal, pretending that he was going to adopt that worship and offer up a great sacrifice. And when they were all shut up where they could not defend themselves, he caused every person of them to be killed. Then Jehu, the good missionary, rested for his labors once more. He went back to the valley and rode to the fountain of Angelud. They call it the fountain of Jezreel, usually. It is a pond about 100 feet square and 4 feet deep, with a stream of water trickling into it from an, under an overhanging ledge of rocks. It is in the midst of a great solitude. Here Gideon pitched his camp in the old times. Behind Shunem lay the Midnites, the, the Amalekites, and the children of the east, who were as grasshoppers for multitude. Both they and their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for the multitude, which means there were 135,000 men and that they had transportation services accordingly. Gideon, with only 300 men, surprised them in the night and stood by and looked on while they butchered each other until 120,000 lay dead on the field. We camped at Jenin before night and got up and started again at 1 o'clock in the morning. Somewhere towards daylight we passed the locality where the best authenticated tradition locates the pit into which Joseph's brethren threw him, and about noon, after passing over a succession of mountain tops, clad with groves of fig and olive trees, with the Mediterranean in sight some forty miles away, and going by many ancient biblical cities, whose inhabitants glowered savagely upon our Christian procession, and were seemingly inclined to practice on it with stones, we came to the singularly terraced and unlovely hills that betrayed that we were out of Galilee and into Samaria at last. We climbed a high hill to visit the city of Samaria, where the woman may have hailed from who conversed with Christ at Jacob's well. And from whence, no doubt, came also the celebrated Good Samaritan. Herod the Great is said to have made a magnificent city of this place, and a great number of coarse limestone columns, twenty feet high and two feet through, or almost guiltless architectural grace of shape and ornament, are pointed out by many authors as evidence of the fact. They would not have been considered handsome in ancient Greece, however. The inhabitants of this camp are particularly vicious, and stoned two parties of our pilgrims a day or two ago, who brought about the difficulty by showing their revolvers when they did not intend to use them, a thing which is deemed bad judgment in the far west, and ought certainly to be considered anywhere. In the new territories, when a man puts his hand on a weapon, he knows that he must use it. He must use it instantly, or expect to be shot down where he stands. These pilgrims had been reading Grimes. There was nothing for us to do in Samaria but buy handfuls of old Roman coins at a franc a dozen, and look at a dilapidated church of the Crusaders, and a vault in it which once contained the body of John the Baptist. This relic was long ago carried away to Genoa. Samaria stood a disastrous siege once in the days of Elisha, 
at the hands of the king of Syria. Provisions reached such a figure that an ass's head was sold for eighty pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. An incident recorded of that heavy time will give one a very good idea of the distress that prevailed within these crumbling walls. As the king was walking upon the battlements one day, a woman cried out, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And the king said, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him, and I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. The prophet Elijah declared that within four and twenty hours the prices of food should go down to nothing, almost, and it was so. The Syrian army broke camp and fled, for some cause or other. The famine was relieved from without, and many a shoddy speculator in dove's dung and ass's meat was ruined. We were glad to leave this hot and dusty old village and hurry on. At two o'clock we stopped to lunch and rest at ancient Sechem, between the historic mounts of Gerizim and Ebal, where in the old times the Book of the Law, the Curses and the Blessings, were read from the heights to the Jewish multitudes below.